In this session, we will learn meaning and origin of microfinance, how the rural poor and needy persons are being provided with small loans so that their standard of living can improve, what we understand by self-help groups, joint liability groups and microfinance institutions. Well, the microfinance has been defined by the National Microfinance Task Force in 1999 as provision of thrift, that means savings, credit and other financial services and products of very small amounts to the poor in rural, semi-urban, urban areas for enabling them to raise their income levels and improve living standards. The whole thrust has been given to bring up the rural poor, improve their standards of living by providing small amount of loans and that is what they needed. How to provide this was a big question. So what are the methods by which, what are the key features of microfinance which we have studied by, by going through the definition. Number one, lend to the poor. As far as possible, don't take security because they don't have any security to offer. Prefer savings over borrowings. That means at least have some group where they can go on savings first before start borrowing. Small short term loans are what is what the requirement of the poor people. And more importantly, the rate of interest. If the rate of interest is very high, then definitely it is going to be uneconomical for these people to take loan. So cost covering interest rates should be determined while extending the loans. Then if possible have a group appraisal system and try to prefer women customers over men. Why and how it is being done that we are going to cover in the next slides. So in short, microfinance means providing banking services to lower income people especially to the poor and very poor. The origin of microfinance started from Bangladesh. They established a bank called as Grameen Bank way back in 1976. And this has become world over, this has become very, very popular now. The major object of this product was to facilitate and promote the standard of living of the poor by providing the savings facilities, small credits that is loans which are required and other financial services such as micro savings, insurance, etc. So that is the beginning of the microfinance way back in 1976. It was started by Dr. Mahmud Yunus. India is a country where nearly 70% of the total population live in rural areas. According to the data available for the year 2010, more than 35% of the population in India earned about less than a dollar a day. So that gives us an indication the poverty which is prevailing in this country. The majority of rural poor, they are basically engaged in agriculture activities or they are employed by the local landowners. Some of them are following the caste oriented occupations like priests, carpenters, blacksmiths, barbers, weavers, potters, leather workers, sweepers, etc. So naturally their earnings are very, very low. The income generated from such activities far from acceptable levels. So if we want to improve the standard of living of these people, we must provide some finance whereby they can engage themselves in productive activities, earn slightly more and improve the standard of living. So in order to help and come out of this particular problem which we have been discussing, the initiative, various initiatives were taken by government of India. The first initiative was nationalization of banks in 1969, whereby 
the banks were directed that you now starting lending to the poor. The second initiative which was taken by Government of India is establishing regional rural banks in 1975. Subsequently, an exclusive institution to take care of the rural lending activities was established which is known as NABARD in 1982. So NABARD was given the responsibility of framing, formulating the schemes through which the rural poor can be provided the amount of money which is required by them which is in small amount. The strategic policy initiatives include establishing a working group on credit to the poor through SSGs that is self-help groups, through NGOs, through NABARD in 1995. A national microfinance task force was established in 1999. Working group on financial flows to the informal sector. This was set up by the Prime Minister's office in 2002. Microfinance Development and Equity Fund was created by NABARD in 2005. Working group on financing NBFCs by banks so that they can on lend to the, the poor people was established by Reserve Bank of India. And banks were asked that you ensure that the entire credit requirements are met by the banks, especially the requirements of self-help groups. What is the money which is required is, one is income generation activities. If the SSG approaches for this type of activities, the banker should provide. Social needs like housing, education, marriage, etc. And debt swapping. That is, swapping of high cost debt with a low cost debt. Normally, we have seen that in India, the brick and mortar branches of the banks are not available all over the country. The number of branches, which are barely about around 40,000 and odd, as against the total number of villages of 6,34,000, in the absence of the banks in these places, the poor people, the rural people, they approach the money lenders where the rate of interest is very high. So in case, if bank can provide loan at a cheaper rate, they will be in a position to pay back the high cost interest rate uh, loans and swap it by uh, low, low interest rate loans. What are the activities undertaken in microfinance? They're basically, there are four types of activities which are undertaken in microfinance. One is microcredit, that is providing small amount of loan as per the requirement of the people. The second is providing a facility to save. Maybe that I'm in a position to earn only about 10 rupees a week, I'm in a position to save. So there should be an avenue for keeping this money safely. So that is what micro savings we mean. Next is micro insurance. The rural people may not be in a position to give big amount of money by way of premium, insurance premium. So we need to develop a product which can take care of the insurance need of the rural and particularly the poor people whereby an affordable premium is kept and insurance can be provided. So this in fact if we can make an affordable insurance policy available to these people, it enables people to concentrate more on their developing their business and other activities so that the risk is taken care of. The last one under the activity of microfinance is remittances. The fourth activity under microfinance is remittances. That is transfer of funds from one place to another place. Maybe even if it is a small amount, a facility should be made available to the rural people that they can transfer funds from one village to another village to their relatives, their friends or business for whatever amount. So this facility has to be made available to them also. Why this is required in India is the next question. The World Bank report on global poverty reveals that India has 421 million people earning below $1.25 a day. This, of course, was in the year 1981. And the number of people who are earning this kind of money 
has increased to 456 million. So the incidence of poverty and hunger in India is alarming. So this calls that it has to be taken in a serious way so that the poor people, particularly the rural people, are provided the facilities of banking, the facilities to save, the facility to get money at a cheaper rate of interest so that they can take up some activities and improve their standard of living by earning more, creating assets to overcome the problems of poverty. What are the approaches? If at all we want to give loan and improve the standards of living of the people, we should have some definite plan of action. Now what is the definite plan of action which has been done in India is that we should establish such institutions whereby people can come together, save together, take loan and then start activities themselves. As I said, the financial institutions in India are very few as compared with the requirement. So the model which was adopted was SSG model, that is self-help group model. So what is this self-help group? It's a group of 15, 20 people, a homogeneous group, where people come together, they have a plan of action. They say that every member will contribute a fixed sum, maybe on a daily basis or weekly basis or a monthly basis according to the decision taken by the group. So they pool the savings. After pooling this, the next step is to lend amongst the group at such rate as decided by the member. The characteristic of a self-help group is that one family, one member. So it cannot be a family group. So that has to be maintained. It can be a group of only men, it can be a group of only women, or it can be a group of uh, those people who come together for a particular activity. And generally, women groups have been found to be very popular and performing. Another important aspect in respect of the self-help group is members of the same social and financial background. So this is an important aspect so that there will not be any conflict of interest. How the group works? The group works first, the members have to contribute. So there will be savings initial. And then they will be given interest on the savings which is pooled together. Now to give interest, there should be some earning. So the lending activity takes place within the group at such rate of interest as decided by the members. What is this self-help group? How it has been defined? Let us have a look at it. NABARD has defined SSG as small economically homogeneous affinity groups of rural poor. Voluntarily formed, this is an important thing, that it is voluntarily formed to save and mutually contribute to a common fund to be lent to its members as per the group member's decision. So basically it is a voluntary group and the savings and lending activities undertaken by the group is as per the decision taken by the members. A group consists of members varying from 10 to 20 members. Why 20 is a question to be asked. If it is more than 20, then such groups need to be registered compulsorily. So normally, an SSG will be maximum 20 members will be there. As women's SSGs or Sangha have been promoted by a wide range of government and non-government agencies, now they make up 90% of all SSGs in India. What are the functions of an SSG? Number one, they organize meetings of the group members. Number two, group, create group managed funds through the savings. The funds which are mobilized are managed by the group members. They give loan to the members. They keep records, provide forum for people to reap the benefits of mutual trust 
and group empowerment. So in short, if a member wants money at a reasonable rate of interest, he can get a small amount of money from the group itself. The rules and regulations of SSG vary according to the preferences of the members. The groups meet regularly, typically once in a week or once per fortnight. The purpose is to collect savings from the members, maintain proper accounts, pass resolutions signed by all members for opening of a savings bank account with a bank. So once this resolution is passed, they can deposit the money which is collected from the members in a bank. They will also meet to decide which member is to be given loan. They will also discuss the joint activities to be taken by the group such as training, running of a community business. When group members start a business activity, definitely it is going to be not by one, but by a group of 10 to 15 people, it is going to be a successful operation. Most SSGs, they have elected persons, a chairman, a deputy, a treasurer, so that the work is divided amongst the people and all these activities like maintenance of records, handling of bank account, all that can be done in an organized way. Most of the SSGs start with initial funding by the members themselves, that is the savings. Savings can be anything. It can be even rupees 10 per week. So there are no restrictions and as decided by the group members, the savings are mobilized. After a consistent saving, say maybe two to three months, then SSGs start giving loans because they are stabilized in two to three months time. Internal rotation of the money takes place and it can be for enterprise activities or consumption needs of the members. And once this is done, once the funds are utilized, the SSGs can approach the banks and other financial intermediaries to get additional fund so that the lending activities which are now at a higher level can be met by taking loans. How self-help groups save? As we have discussed already, it is from the savings which are mobilized from the members and then they on lend to the members usually at such rates as decided by the members. And if they don't want to wish anybody is not interested in taking money, the amount can be deposited in a bank, definitely some amount of interest can be earned by depositing the members funds. The SSG bank linkage model has been devised by NABARD. There are three models under this. One is bank itself acts as a self-help promotion institution. So they take the initiative in forming the groups, nurtures them over a period of time and then provides credit so that the lending activity can be undertaken by the group members themselves. The second model is a group formed by NGOs, non-governmental organizations or by government agencies. The group is nurtured, trained by these agencies and then after the training is given, the bank provides credit directly to the SSGs. While the bank provides loans to the group directly, the facilitating agencies continue their interaction with the SSGs. They keep a track whether the SSG is working properly or not. Are they maintaining their accounts properly or not? Are they meeting regularly or not? How the money is being used? Whether the repayment as per this schedule given by the bank is being done or not? Entire thing is done by the NGO. This model also has been very, very popular and more acceptable to the bank because the NGOs keep an eye on the working of the SSGs. 